It's dawn on Lake Kivu in the Democratic Republic of Congo. We're heading to a national park that is also a war zone. Kahuzi Bayega is one of the last strongholds of Africa's endangered gorillas. <laughs> But the rangers who once led tourists here are under siege. Every morning they drill against possible armed attacks. Right now there are rebel fighters all through the park, but there's been a lull in the fighting which should allow us to go in today to see some of the guerrillas who survived this human conflict. Finally, we get the all clear and head into the forest. It is home to one of the richest ecosystems in Africa. For more than a decade, it's also been the base for thousands of gun-toting rebels. They have slaughtered the wildlife and terrorized the local people. Only the courage and dedication of these rangers have kept the gorilla population alive. Just an hour after leaving the road, we come across our first great ape, an adult male silverback. Nearby, we find his extended brood. Against the odds, they've survived, but their numbers are dwindling. More than two-thirds of these gorillas have been wiped out since the war began. Even as they feed, they hear the sounds of war. Military planes fly overhead, supplying troops fighting the rebels. This is quite amazing to be seeing these animals in the wild. They show no fear of humans, but of course they should, because unbelievably the rebels have been killing these and other animals for food and selling the orphans as pets. And it's quite sobering to think that even in a tiny way, each and every one of us could be contributing to the war that's killing them. We live in a world of electronic gadgets. Whether it's the latest iPhone, laptop or PlayStation, they all depend on a miraculous mineral known here as coltan. All inside a simple sculpted design that feels great in your hand. It's a simple ore that can store vast electrical charges, allowing computers and other devices to become ever smaller and more complex. And in the Congo, coltan and other minerals have fueled a terrible war that most Western consumers have never even heard of. At one point in the war, uh, coltan, which is this mine we're going to today, was the main source of profit for rebel groups in eastern Congo, particularly in, in 2000 and 2001. There was an enormous boom in the market due to a perfect storm of factors, including the issuing of a new Sony PlayStation and many other things. Jason Stearns has spent the past eight years investigating the war. His reports for groups like the United Nations paint a devastating picture of blood minerals, armed groups extorting money from miners to fund their fighting. You can basically imagine the Eastern Congo as a shifting pattern of various mafia, such mafia-like organizations. With the largest one is, would be the Congolese state itself, which uh, some people compare to a very large syndicate or racket itself. Any trip in the Congo is long, arduous and dangerous. In our journey, we'll try to find out if our demand for gadgets is prolonging the war. 
But just a warning, in this story we're going to show you some quite confronting images. If you're not comfortable with that, you might like to switch over to something lighter on a different station. Just bear in mind, even that remote control contains coltan. Ever since Europeans arrived in the Congo, it's been a place to plunder. Even Hollywood films like African Queen have traded off romantic notions of the dark heart of Africa. I never dreamed that any mere physical experience could be so stimulating. Outsiders brought misery from Arab and Portuguese slave traders to the British journalist Henry Morton Stanley. He not only found the lost explorer Dr Livingston, he made a fortune helping Belgium set up a colony that became a byword for brutality. After independence in 1960, the stealing continued, this time under the dictator Mobutu Sese Seko, who was propped up by the West. I am pleased to have been able to meet again with President Mobutu, who's been a faithful friend of the United States for some 20 years. Mobutu held onto power for 32 years while the country fell apart around him. It collapsed completely after the 1994 genocide in neighbouring Rwanda, when ethnic Hutus tried to wipe out the Tutsi minority. You had almost close to a million people massacred and then a million refugees streamed across the border into the eastern Congo, along with the people who had committed the genocide. Those refugees and those people then destabilized this country and sparked a regional war where you had Rwanda but other countries in the region invading the Congo. More than a decade on, a series of vicious armed groups continue to operate here, living off the minerals and other resources in the territory they see. It was like they got their hand stuck in the cookie jar. It, they got a, a liking for the other things they found in the Congo. And they use civilians as bargaining chips. What you're about to see is hard to watch, but it's the true face of what's going on here. Mm -hmm. This woman is Francoise Cavira. Rebels attacked her village in one of the frequent turf wars for mineral rich territory. They set fire to more than 250 houses. Alicia Lala, who's 24, lost her children as well. Cette dame, elle était dans sa maison. Donc les inciviques, en fait, ils sont arrivés, ils ont fermé la porte. Ils ont mis le feu. Ils ont mis le feu et elle, elle saura pas dire comment elle s'est retrouvée dehors. Ses deux enfants sont morts. Dr. Chantal Gumba runs a hospital for the aid group Médecins Sans Frontières. State hospitals have almost ceased to function. Every day she deals with the casualties of war. Lives destroyed, families torn apart, children suffering with adults. C'est un enfant de 8 mois que nous avons admis il y a une semaine pour un diarrhée, vomissement, compliqué de déshydratation. Mm -hmm. Mais quand tu regardes l'enfant, euh, l'aspect clinique par rapport à ses rumeurs, tu vois bien que c'est un enfant qui est malnutri. So how can people be so destitute in a region that should be wealthy? The hills of eastern Congo have some of the richest mineral deposits in the world. Not just coltan, but vast reserves of diamonds, tin, or in the case of this area, gold. Like coltan, gold is used in almost all electronic devices, mainly as a non-corrosive conductor. 
but you won't find anything high-tech here. It's a long walk across a treeless landscape in searing heat. Everything has to be carried in or out by foot. Hundreds work in primitive and dangerous conditions. Many are children. <laughs> the mine used to be run by a Tutsi militia controlled by the Rwandan government. In a recent peace deal, it was merged with the Congolese army, but as far as exploitation goes, it's business as usual. We found it guarded by government soldiers living off the proceeds. We had to pay them to be allowed to film. The miners have to pay them just to work here. They operate as rackets. Um, they offer protection to diggers like the diggers in the coal sand mine. And if they don't get a payback, there's always the threat of violence. Even though they give half of what they make to the soldiers, it's the only way most have to make a living. So here's the thing, just about all these small mines have to pay off the gunmen, whether it's the militias or the Congolese army. But the war has so ravaged the local economy that there's really no choice. If you shut down all these mines, many of these people would just starve, including the children. This eastern region used to be the country's food bowl. Now many live on the brink of famine. On our way to the Coltan mine with Jason Stearns, we meet a group of villagers who tell us the gunmen don't just take the minerals they dig, they also take the food they grow. While Jason Stearns has helped expose the people's plight, it's made him an enemy of those in power. When we reach the Coltan mine, we're ordered to put our camera away. With a hidden camera, we can show why. It turns out the mine is owned by a Congolese senator. Even though we have all the government documents allowing us to come here, he refuses to let us enter. From a distance, we manage to sneak a glimpse of the mine at work. It's clearly not going at full steam. The price of coltan crashed a few years ago, and it's been hit again by the global financial crisis. What's more, electronics giants like Apple claim they're taking steps to ensure they don't use coltan from this area. But Jason Stearns believes that's a PR claim that can't be justified. I think as long as you have militias in the Eastern Congo taxing these mines, they will find a way of getting these minerals onto the international market. They'll smuggle them onto the market, they'll sell them, sell them to countries like Malaysia, Thailand or China, who do not have the same sort of focus on due diligence and, and, uh, and transparency as countries like Australia and the United States may have. Off camera, local exporters insisted they don't sell coltan overseas anymore due to all the controversy. 
But it didn't take us long to find a busy coltan trader. Mr Innocent Watuta buys it directly from the miners and sells it to those same local exporters. He says he's still trading coltan, but making a lot less money these days and has little idea of where it ends up. À notre niveau, c'est des états qu'on a appris que c'est le téléphone mobile, c'est le, uh -huh. je ne sais pas moi, les ordinateurs. Australia is the only other country to have large reserves of coltan, known in Australia as tantalite. But the Australian mine has stopped working, claiming it can't compete with cheap African exports. Comme vous savez, il y a un mouvement dans l'Ouest de pas acheter coltan de l'Afrique. Oui. Du Congo. Qu'est-ce que vous pensez à ce mouvement Nous, nous pensons que c'est une autre aussi, une autre façon aussi de pénaliser les Africains, en particulier, mais aussi les, les sites qui vous siez, les Congo en, en particulier, pardon. Nous sommes en difficulté. Et je pense que si on, pourrait, on pouvait injecter un peu d'argent dans cette activité, donc l'activité minière, ça suffit au lieu de nous donner des dons, toujours des dons, des dons, des dons qui ne nous servent à rien. Je pense que... Il paraîtrait que lâchez-vous, vous dites que le coltan de l'Est, c'est le coltan du ça, je ne sais pas quoi. Mm -hmm. Mais en vérité, je ne pense pas que ce soit le coltan du ça, puisque c'est ça, nous vivons au départ de ça. Coltan does feed the rebels and does fuel conflict or enable conflict. It also feeds 300, 400,000 people who are just petty traders or are digging in the pits. So we don't want to throw the baby out, out with the bathwater. So what do you say to people who, who might be watching this thinking, should I get an iPhone, should I get a PlayStation? I think that there's very little that can be done at the moment to prevent people from buying iPhones and PlayStations. I think that if you really want to get rid of conflict in the Eastern Congo, I think it's going to be the government's job to do so. This year alone, more than a million people have been displaced by the fighting. They seek refuge at camps like this next to a UN base in North Kivu. More than five million people have died since the fighting began, mostly from disease and starvation. The biggest number in a single conflict since the Second World War. Mari Rubu and her family of six have been living in this tent since February, when rebels destroyed her village. The DRC is a very rich country. It has so many minerals. Why is everybody here so poor? Je vous montre quelque chose d'extraordinaire. C'est le iPhone. iPhone. Okay. Given that they've never seen the proceeds of the mineral riches, it seemed only fair they should see what their minerals can do. Okay. Un, deux, trois. Oh. There's no reason why people here shouldn't be enjoying the benefits of the area's vast resources. But for more than a century, the riches have been pillaged by a small minority. One of the constitutions of the Congolese Republic under Mobutu had 14 articles. And Mobutu said, the article number 15 is fend for yourselves. And that has become sort of a doctrine for many Congolese. Fend for yourselves. Is it wrong that I steal? I have to do it. I have to survive. Ordinary people now survive through sheer ingenuity. Too poor to buy transport, they build bikes entirely from wood. When they move house, they literally move house. Such resourcefulness is necessary because the government exists in name only. The state employs officials, but often doesn't pay them. They demand bribes without providing services. Even security, such as there is, comes courtesy of the international community. The United Nations has its largest peacekeeping force in the Democratic Republic of Congo.
It not only shelters refugees, it provides them with basic services like schools. The state has simply abandoned them. The UN supports the Congolese army, even supplying them with food. That's controversial given the role many Congolese soldiers play in attacking their own people. And the UN hasn't been able to protect women from the most common crime of all, mass rape. Chantal Gumba's hospital has become a gathering point for its victims. The measure of the madness here is what passes for improvement. Comment est-ce que vous expliquez ce degré de violence C'est une bonne question, mais qui est vraiment difficile à, à répondre. The reality is that rape is used as a weapon of war, partly to cling on to territory rich in minerals. So, where does this all leave us? Are minerals like coltan helping fund this war? Absolutely. As coltan, or tantalum as it's also known from the Congo, wound up in your mobile or laptop? Well, it's impossible to know. And if the world stopped buying these minerals, would it end the war? Well, all that's certain is it would put hundreds of thousands of people out of work. Perhaps the real question is why we need a connection with mobile phones to care about what happens here. So let's end this story where we began. It says much about our Western sensibilities that the plight of gorillas has done more to raise awareness of the war than the plight of people. Zoos have begun asking consumers to recycle their mobile phones to help save the great apes. And it is all connected. People won't be safe until these animals are too. All are in danger from the same militias. But the suffering will only end when the government makes peace with the warring parties. And that will only happen when a world connected by gadgets remembers the most important connection of all. The real challenge for people around the world is to recognize that we do have a shared humanity. And whether they're black or white or whatever color of skin they may have and wherever they live, a life is worth a life.